All right. So let's first off start off with the fun stuff. Let's start off with some questions about Temporal. Now, when it comes to this trivia, there, there is no prices. Uh, it would be really cool if you can uh, maybe type in your question, uh, answers in the chat. Uh, so these types of the trivia is just maybe to get, have some fun, learn some stuff about Temporal and also kind of engage with uh, maybe bring up some questions that you might have and think of uh you know during you know while we're doing this so let's go ahead and get started this is question number one so the question is which programming language does not have a temporal sdk currently and uh so a is java b php c cobol d go or e node.js and i'll give about 20 30 seconds for you guys to type in the answers in the chat uh and uh see who wins i guess or who is right or who is wrong so I'll be quiet and see the chat. Let's see what we're having. We have, okay, Kobo is, <laughs> okay, people are typically Kobo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's see. Uh, if, yes, if you pick C, Kobo, you were correct. And and we also, if we have currently uh, other SDKs, plain but one is the, the works not yet, yet endorsed is our SDK in Rust. So whoever got the question right, congratulations. And let's move on to the next question. The next question is, what's the name of the temporal CLI? And also options A, TCLI, B, TCTL, D, Temp CLI, or D, Cool CLI. And I'm watching, let's watch the chat. What we're getting, Cool CLI, okay, okay. Sean with the answer. Okay, <laughs> all right, Vladimir, it says TCTL. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and reveal the answer, if that's okay. So, all right, if you pick B, TCTL, you were right, and you can install TCTL two ways, either local install by cloning our temporal Git repository and run make bins on it. And if you're a Mac, of course, and uh, running on, with Homebrew, you can easily install it with brew install TCTL as well. All right, so ready for the third question. Now, here is a question. The question is, what is a temporal worker? Uh, a, a person that works at Temporal. B, a new office space movie. C, a process that executes workflows and activities. Or D, some sort of workout equipment. All right, let's give it some time for answers. My people are picking C. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's pretty good right there. Don't worry, the questions get uh, much harder soon, so no problem. Oh, definitely, we have a definitely A, <laughs> all right. Good, E of all of the above, that's also, all right. So let's reveal the answer. Yes, if you answer C, you're correct. A temporal worker is a process that executes your workflows and activities. And here on the bottom, you can see an example uh, with our Go SDK. Uh, where on the first line, we define a new worker. We pass it in the name of its task queue, and you can also define some workflow options. And then you can use that worker to register things like your workflows and your activities. All right, so let's go on to the next question. All right, so now the next question is, in our PH temporal PHP SDK, how do you declare a workflow interface? So... The uh, A is uh, annotated with this uh, hashtag bracket workflow interface. B, define an interface called workflow interface. C, annotated with at workflow interface. Or D, you don't need to define it at all. So, all right, let's give it some time. All right, so we're getting uh, Mila to D, okay. Uh, we have a B. All right, I actually have no idea. <laughs> that is also a good answer. I'll give it a couple more seconds. All right, All right no problem. So in our PHP SDK, we use uh, PHP attributes. And if you want to learn more about that, here is a URL uh, for that. And the PHP attributes have the format of this hashtag bracket uh, and close bracket. And uh, with the PHP SDK, which is very similar actually from the API perspective to our Java SDK as well, you can use uh, PHP attributes to also define an uh, activity interface, activity method, uh, workflow methods, and also query 
and your signal methods as well. All right, so congratulations whoever picked A in for this question. All right, so far so good, let's move on. All right, so next question that we have for everybody is what is a workflow side effect? And A, a workflow side effect is when you get a fever after executing too many workflows. B, a construct used to safely execute non-deterministic code inside workflows. C, an error thrown during workflow execution. Or D, a name of Maxime's old garage band. All right, so we get, let's see the answers. Definitely D, all right, Kali, we get it. Are we getting a B, B, yeah, yeah, most of all, I think, all right. So let's see, whoever picked B, congratulations. Yes, it is a construct used to safely execute non-deterministic code inside workflows. And below we see in our Java SDK an example where we use workflow.side effect uh, on the first line here to, to get a, a system environmental variable. Uh, and also uh, below that, we show how we can use a side effect uh, with the Java SDK to, for example, get a um, random number in our workflow code as well. All right, so let's move on to the next question. We're almost, I think, halfway through, if not even more. All right, this is a hard question for everybody. Uh, again, the Java SDK, what happens when you set the max attempts for activity retries to negative one? Now, if you remember with temporal, uh, the, the default for activity retries is set to unlimited. Uh, now, the question is, what if you define your activity options and your retry options and then set it the maximum attempts to minus one? A, activity will fail. It will never be retried. B, nothing will happen if an activity fails. C, if an activity fails, it will be retried forever. Or D, Workflow execution throws an illegal, illegal argument exception. All right, let's give it some time. We got C, 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 all right. Okay, let's go ahead and see anybody else wants to answer, nope. All right, let's go. If you answered actually D, you will be correct. Uh, when the workflow execution starts, uh, and your activity options are red. In the Java SDK, you, uh, you will get uh, throw an illegal argument exception that the value of maximum attempts cannot be negative, right? It has to be. In the Go SDK, it's the same thing. You can look in your, for example, temporal web UI, and uh, you can see that maximum attempts cannot be a negative on the retry policy. You'll see that there as well. All right, we good? Let's move on. All right, let's move on to our temporal node SDK and ask a question for our node guys here. In the node SDK, how do you define activities? A, uh, you define interface that extends the quote unquote activity interface. B, it's not possible to do it currently. C, you have to define a module that exports an activity function. Or D, you can define activities as any other ASIC function in your code. So let's go ahead and wait for that. I've got Michael answered D, that's cool. Let's see what else we got. We got another answer for D. I'll give it a couple more seconds. All right, so let's reveal the answer. And yes, both Michael and Milad were correct. Thank you, good job. And you can define uh, activities in the node as gives any other async function. And here you can see an example where we define an async function uh, with the name greet and we export it. This is our, becomes our activity function. And in, in below in our workflow code, we can import it. And in our workflow uh, function, just uh, call it uh, as any other async function type. All right, so next question, we got a couple more only. Now let's go to the Go SDK a little bit. So the question is, in a Go SDK activity, if the activity is retried, how can you get the current execution attempt number? So in this case, we're having an activity. It might have failed and it needs to be retried. 
And how can you, in your activity code, get the current execution attempt number? A, with activity.currentRetry attempt, B, temporal.retries.attempt, C, we get activity.getInfo passing in the context.attempt, or D, it is currently not possible to do that. All right, we got a couple of Cs. All right, a bunch of Cs, all right. Anybody else? Nope. All right, let's go ahead and reveal the answer. Yes, whoever answers C, you were correct. Good job. <laughs> it is uh, activity.getInfo, passing in the context, activity context, and, and going the attempt, getting the attempt. And below you can see the similar or the same uh, how you can get it in the Java SDKs by creating an activity execution context and calling .getInfo.getAttempt on it as well. And don't forget it starts with one. So the first will be a one, not a zero. All right, good job on that one, everybody. Let's go ahead. Now, this is the hardest question I have to say, and, and we have only one more after that, I think, but this is the hardest question. And the question is in this Java, uh, in the Java SDK, what's the value of result? And what we have here on top, just to let you know, we have a workflow class called my workflow implementation which implements IO temporal workflow, dynamic workflow. So if you see on top here, we, you, this uh, workflow class does not really implement an activity interface that you defined, but it defines this interface called dynamic workflow. And what it does, it overrides the execute method and gets encoded uh, arguments. And the first line here says workflow.getInfo.get workflow type. So we get the workflow type. Then we get the first argument from our arguments passed to our workflow method. And then we return the string type, type, and arg, arg. On the bottom part here, uh, we see our actually, for example, starter code where we define our worker and we register, uh, register our workflow um, type. And then we create a workflow stub, but if you see it's an untyped workflow stub, so we don't define, uh, and we pass in the type of the workflow as string. And the string here is some workflow type, all right? So that's not the name of uh, the type of our my workflow defined class. And we start our workflow passing in hello, and we wait with get result for it to finish and to get the result. So that's the question in this par particular code, what would be the res final result here on the bottom where we have string result? And the answers are A, type some workflow type, which is the same string that we pass here as the workflow type, and arg hello. B is null. C means code will raise exception workflow type not registered. Or would it be D, just it would be just hello. All right, so hopefully that made sense. So we have, let me see the answers. We have an A, A, and a C. All right. Is that it? Anybody else wants to answer? Nope. All right, let's move on. Yeah, if you answered A, so you and, and Michael, <laughs> congratulations. It would actually, <laughs> this is something new with the dynamic interface. Uh, basically, if you register a workflow with this type uh, that implements this interface, it can actually uh, be invoked for any type that is not explicitly registered, right? So in this case, even though we're invoking the type some workflow type, uh, because that's not implicit, uh, registered with the worker, uh, our my workflow implementation workflow will, will get executed and you can get the workflow type here using workflow get info get workflow type and you can get the arguments there as well. And remember, you can only have one of these registered per workers, right? Per for a single work. All right, so that was the toughest question. Now to our final question, and this is just you guys can guess, uh, which temporal employee went to University of Washington and had his first job as a machine learning engineer? So the answers here are Ryland, who's our head of product, Sean, our product manager, Maxime, our CEO, or Samar, our CTO. And let's see what we got here. We got B, <laughs> A, Anyway, so let's go ahead and reveal that. And the answer is A, Ryland, our head of product. And here's a picture with him of his cool dog, Audrey. 
And with that, I will shut up and give, hand it over to Ryland uh, to talk, to give us all a cloud update. Thank you. Thank you, Theo. Let me get uh, things set up. All right, awesome. So uh, hello, everyone. I'm super duper happy that we're able to have another one of these. Um, it's been a while, I think a long while, like six months. Uh, so sorry about that. And it will definitely become a much more regular thing now, uh, mostly because we have awesome people like Tio working here. So you know we can actually, we have the resources and the time to do it. Uh, and so I'm mostly going to let all my amazing teammates uh, do the talking today. Uh, but first, I just wanted to briefly talk about Temporal Cloud. Uh, it's something that we're getting a lot of questions about, a lot of interest about, and so it just seemed like a, a good form to address that. Uh, so Temporal Cloud is fully managed version of Temporal Service, um, obviously maintained by us. Everything is handled for you. So like that includes like things like Elasticsearch. You just connect your workers and you run. That's all you have to do. Uh, and we have an ideal configuration and topology for the service. So this allows us to achieve super duper high rates while maintaining reliability at scale. Um, and we're the experts in deploying and running and operating this technology. Our team is comprised of basically the brightest veterans of the infrastructure and system space, you know, writing a lot of the infrastructure primitives that you're even using in other cloud vendors. Uh, one sec. Having an issue. There you go. And so, yeah, so far, uh, our cloud is off to an amazing start. I just kind of wanted to share some stats. Um, we've been running our cloud service for about six months, actually a little bit less. Uh, and we already have, you know, uh, 10 plus paying customers. Our first customer was a tens of billions dollar enterprise, which we honestly didn't expect to have as a first customer. Uh, and so we've been incredibly fortunate so far with the demand and support that we've seen. And we just really appreciate the amount of trust which the community has put into us. Uh, and so there's, you know, as you can see, there's some other stats up there. Um, we already have like five plus engagements with uh, publicly traded companies. Um, there's hundreds of people and companies on the wait list. So it's actually looking really, really exciting. And I do want to highlight a few specific amazing partners that we're super duper fortunate to work with. Uh, so Descript uh, is the one on the left. They're building a revolutionary transcription and media editing platform. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, it's honestly amazing. You can just delete text and replace it uh, with new text and like it will actually interpolate your voice and it will sound like you. Uh, so that's just mind blowing. Uh, and then Checker is the provider of background checks for pretty much for everyone. Uh, and so, you know, if like you ever need background checks to the service, like Checker is like the, the name in the game right now. Uh, and they're an awesome company to work with, super progressive, um, like probably would be a great place to work as well. Uh, and then Bolt uh, is another partner we're working with. They were actually our first uh, public cloud customer. It's an amazing team over at Bolt, and they're building a very thoughtful horizontal, horizontal solution for e-commerce checkout. Uh, and so if you're in the e-commerce space and you're you know, annoyed by having to set up your own payment processing and all that stuff every time, like Bolt has a very, very nice solution for that. Uh, and I specifically want to call out actually Descript um, because they deserve a special shout out. Uh, and that's because they were the first case study for Temporal Cloud. And so uh, Sean, uh, product manager here at Temporal, wrote an awesome study with Nicholas, um, one of the guys over at Descript. Uh, and it's definitely worth reading. So the link is in the cloud down there. And so kind of want to end it off just saying like your company can be on the cloud too. Uh, the service is not GA and that's explicitly because we're still in the design partnership phase where we're looking for design partners. Um, we do provide operational and support SLA for the cloud service. So it's by no means like a beta or an alpha or anything like that. Um, we're just being very picky about, you know, how we onboard people and how many people we onboard. Uh, and so really, you know, we're looking for companies to iterate with. Um, that's the goal right now. And so we, we believe with the right feedback and the right partners, like we can build the future of cloud application development. So if you have any doubt doubts about like, you know, whether it's the right time to join, like there, you shouldn't have any doubts, like this is the best time to get on the ship. And so I put a little bit of contact information. Um, there's an email you can reach out if you're interested in the hosted service. And if you ever want to like chat about it, you just have questions, whatever, uh, feel free to reach out to me on Slack or on Twitter. I put my, my handle there. Uh, and I'm also sure in the Q&A portion at the end, I'm happy to answer questions about the cloud if people have them. Um, so that's, that's all I have. I don't want to take too much time with, you know, like advertisement or something, but I figure a lot of people have been asking about it. So it's a good time to share some information. I think I'll pass it on. I don't know. Uh, Tio is, is Rob or Dominic next? Next we have Dominic. Got it. All right. Hello everybody. <clears throat> oh, sorry. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Dominic. I'm an uh, engineer at uh, Tempora. And today we want to talk about invincible apps. Now, if you have been to the Tempora website, or also today you heard it multiple times, Tempora built invincible apps. Now, 
that sounds uh, like a, a slick marketing term. However, that is not just a marketing term. That is actually our mission, invincible applications. But if that is our mission, we have to know what invincible applications actually means. So here at Temporal, we define invincibility in terms of uh, scalability and reliability. So <clears throat> scalability is defined as uh, responsiveness in the presence of load. And reliability is defined as responsiveness in the presence of failure. An application is invincible. If the application is scalable and reliable by construction, not by mandate, not as I say so, but by construction, because it is. And typically an application that is scalable and reliable by construction, that is also referred to as being elastic, it's an elastic application. So by definition, yeah, an application that is scalable and reliable by construction must be able to detect and mitigate load and it must be able to detect and mitigate failure. But how do we achieve you know, scalability and reliability by construction? We only have unscalable and unreliable components at our disposal. Right? Operating system processes come and go. Um, the function calls, the function execution within them, live with the host, live in the lifetime host. When they are gone, they are gone. So traditionally, you are responsible to compose unscalable and unreliable components into scalable and reliable systems. That is a complex, that is a daunting task. Yeah. However, here, temporal is responsible to compose unscalable and unreliable components into scalable and reliable components. Now from there, you are responsible to compose already scale and reliable components into scalable and reliable systems. A much less complex, a much less daunting task. Don't sweat load, don't sweat failure. Temporal detects and mitigates load and failure for you. And Temporal ensures your application is scalable and reliable by construction. Now, can you do this yourself? Can you compose scalable, uh, unscalable and unreliable components into scalable and reliable systems? Of course, yeah. However, keep in mind, this is Temporal's core business case, Temporal's core use case. We're looking at at least a decade of solid distributed system theory and solid distributed system practice. Every mistake you are going to make is a mistake temporal already made and fixed. So it's gonna be very hard to beat this system. Now, if we talk about scalable and reliable components that temporal provides, what is that? What is that scalable and reliable component? Well, that's a temporal workflow. That is a reliable business process execution or a reliable function execution. But what does it mean? So <clears throat> when we compare traditional systems and temporal, we see the process in temporal called the worker, the process as a hosting unit, everything happens within a process. When a, a request, when you send a request to a process, yeah, uh, you typically call a function, the request handler, and uh, the function is now, or the request and the function execution, they are alike. Right? So your application works on this, uh, on this request and uh, eventually returns a response. <clears throat> so multiple requests come in. You will have... Uh, multiple requests, multiple function executions in flight. And of course, over the time, function, uh, function execution request comes in, function execution response comes up. What happens in term of a failure to all of these function executions that are in flight? Well, when the process vanishes, the process dies, everything in flight 
going with it. Now, eventually, when your process comes back, traditionally, all of these function executions, all of these business processes that were in the middle of execution are gone. However, when you look at temporal, all of these business executions at the point where they were forcefully stopped will resume. So on a traditional system, you will be faced with inconsistencies. You will be faced with unhappy customers because your business process executions did not run to completion. On the temporal side, once the system recovers, your business processes pick up where they were and will run to completion. So temporal can deal with any numbers of failures that you throw at it. It can deal with transient failures. <clears throat> failures that uh, are no more likely to occur in the near uh, future if there was a failure in the near past. That are typically uh, compute failures. For example, one of your nodes crashes. That doesn't necessarily mean another node is gonna crash. It can deal with intermittent failures. For example, or, or intermittent failures. It's a failures where there is a, the likelihood of a failure happening in the near future is elevated if there was a, a failure in the near past. There are oftentimes network failures. So once you have, for example, a network partition, it is more likely that the network partition sticks around for a while. Temporal can even deal with permanent failures where the likelihood of a failure happening again uh, in the near future is 100% if, if it happened in the near past. A uh, typical example is a null pointer exception. After you fix the null pointer exception, Temporal can pick up where it happened and drive your process to completion. So Temporal provides reliability over the entire failure spectrum, transient, intermittent, and permanent. So, and in conclusion, if we assume that all failures are transparent or, or, or in, intermittent, or that all permanent failures will be repaired, and the fair loss hypothesis applies, that is the hypothesis that eventually one of a potential infinite sequence of retries succeeds. Then temporal can actually guarantee that your business process runs to completion successfully. Intentional infinite loops excluded. Thank you very much. That was uh, my brief overview of uh, temporal and the guarantee uh, it gives you. If you want to chat about distributed system, anything from distributed transactions, two-phase commit consistencies, or anything else in the context or out of context temporal, please do hit me up. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rob. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you very much. Share my screen. Hey, so I'm Rob Holland. Uh, I'm a solutions architect at Temporal. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, data conversion API that we offer in the Java and Go SDKs, uh, also landing shortly in Ruby. So um, a lot of people ask, and it's getting more and more common, about encryption in Temporal and whether there is a way to encrypt stuff such that um, it is stored in the database or for the hosted version on our cloud uh, so that um, it's available to the workers and to operators and developers who are using the system, but it's not stored into the database unencrypted. Uh, so this is a workflow that allows this to happen. Uh, we've got the code uh, for you to copy and hack on to get it working for your systems uh, in the samples go and samples go, sorry, samples go and sample Java repositories. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through the Go version and just give you a quick demo. Um, so I've got a simple workflow here. Uh, this is running the exact code that's in the samples repo. Um, and the the workflow is very simple. It calls one activity with some parameters um, and then just returns the result of that activity as the result of the workflow. As uh, so you can see, we're just passing a name parameter through here. Uh, I've disabled the encryption stuff to start with, just so you can see how it looks uh, without the encryption enabled. Uh, so I'm just going to run the worker and run the starter, which is just a script which causes the workflow to one. So you can see in the output here um, that the workflow ran. Uh, you can see uh, the, all the inputs and results were in plain text, hello, my secret friend, 
Uh, as you'd expect, this is normal behavior because there's no encryption being applied. And just have a quick peek at this so you see what the history looks like. If we go into this in the temporal web UI, um, you can see uh, the input and results in plain text as you'd expect in the history as well, uh, inputs and results being passed through uh, between the activity and the workflow. Uh, so this is standard stuff. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna turn on the encryption. So the data converter interface needs to be um, used at every entry and exit to the system. So in this example, we've got a starter, which is uh, going to be sending data to Temporal to trigger the workflow. Included that is the inputs to the workflow. So it's important that the thing that's starting the workflow has the encryption in place so that the initial inputs to the system are encrypted. So just uncommented that. And then the worker, obviously, which is actually going to do the work, needs to be able to decrypt the inputs to the workflow. And then it needs to be able to encrypt the inputs to the activity, decrypt the results from the activity, and encrypt the results that it's going to store for the workflow. So I've uncommented those lines. I'm just going to restart the worker now. Okay, And then I'm going to run the workflow again. Now, one thing to notice here is that all of this is still plain text. So hello, my secret friend still appears. It's not encrypted. And the reason is because that the code that this, the context that this code is running in has access to the data converter decryption. So you'll see that all of this is still in plain text. It doesn't look any different from this point of view. Uh, if we go into the, uh, um, sorry, can, someone's talking, can someone mute? Uh, uh, if we go into the history here, uh, we will see that actually in temporal, uh, unlike the previous run, the, the history is encrypted. The inputs and results from the workflow and the activity have been encrypted by the data converter. So what's actually stored in the database will be this encrypted block, uh, and plain text is not stored anywhere by temporal. Um, so this is great, but it does leave us with a bit of an issue. And that is, well, how can we now see this information uh, as a developer? I should mention, by the way, that even though the inputs and results were encrypted, we did get the right result out for the code uh, from the context of somewhere that has this encryption enabled. So obviously you can use the results. It's not encrypted when it finally hits you at the end. So if we run um, workflow list, I'm gonna do show. Uh, and I'm just gonna use the workflow ID. So we'll get the last result. Uh, oh, hang on, I think I've already still got the plugin loaded. All right, let's try that again. Sorry about that. So you can see that uh, without this plugin loaded, which I was about to demo, just jumped ahead of myself slightly there, uh, you can see that the TCTL does not have access to the unencrypted content because it doesn't understand how to decrypt it. So this is what someone would see if they're just pulling from the database directly. Uh, so it says uh, encoding is not supported. It can't actually show you stuff because it's encrypted in the database. So what we've done, we've added a plugin system to uh, Temporal TCTL command line, which allows you to plug in the same data converter that you plug into your uh, workflow code, your worker code, sorry. Um, so if I do, I'm not gonna set that environment back up. Um, So in the uh, sample directory, there's uh, an example plugin that you could use to uh, plug into TCOTL, which would do the decryption for you. So I'm just setting the environment such that TCTL can see that command. So now if I run the same TCTL thing again, you can see that now the plugin is enabled, uh, it's able to decrypt stuff. So TCTL, all your operators using the command line can now have the access to the decrypted value which is decrypted locally on their laptops, even though the encrypted value is the only thing stored in the database. And then the final step through to here is that we still have the issue that we can't see the uh, plain text in the web UI because it has no access to the decrypted data. So what we've done, we've added support for TCTL um, to be able to run a WebSocket locally Uh, so, um, so you run a command on TCTL command uh, we, and give it the path to your web interface. If you click through onto that link, it will configure the uh, 
the web interface to talk to the local WebSocket so that it can then decrypt the payloads using TCTL locally on your laptop. So you can see that now the previously encrypted content is plain text again because the web UI, the web UI JavaScript code in the browser is able to talk to the WebSocket locally running on your laptop and do the decryption. Um, so to just give a bit of an overview of like the security boundaries for this, uh, this is a bit of a diagram to show you uh, where the boundaries are. So basically TCTL, sorry, Temporal Cloud or your own hosted version would be on the left side of this security boundary here and no plain text ever enters that. So the database stores only encrypted stuff and that's sent and received to the other systems. You can see that your workers run a data converter which is able to decrypt stuff to feed it in and take it out from your activities and workflows. And your activities and workflows don't need to know that anything is encrypted. It's com they're completely oblivious to this. And then in TCTL running locally, we've added support for plugins so that you can take the same data converter, which you normally compile into your workers. And you can use that so that TCTL locally on your laptop can do the decryption and encryption that it needs to, to trigger workflows with encrypted payloads and to get the results back and decrypt them so you can see them. And then we have the last step, which is the link between the TCTL, sorry, the web UI, uh, and then a web socket, which TCTL, TCTL can launch, which keeps all of the information locally on your laptop and doesn't require any plain text being sent over the wire outside of the uh, local network. Uh, and there's some obviously comments to go a bit more into detail about that on that diagram. Uh, but yeah, that, that's, that's how it works. All of this is uh, released as in committed to master. The TCTL plugin support uh, will be available in the next public release of the binaries. And yeah, that's it. If anyone's asking any questions, let me know. I've now run through this very quickly. Um, yeah, but uh, any questions, just give us a shout. Thanks for that. Uh, I think we're going to hand over to uh, Tio again for general Q&A now. Okay. Thank you, Rob. All right. so. All right, so we have about 14 minutes left. So I don't really see any questions right now in chat. So please, you know, let us know if you have any questions, if you want to put them in chat or if you want to raise your hand. All right, we have some raising his hand. <laughs> Go ahead. No. <laughs> uh, but if you have any questions, please let us know and, and, and we'll be happy to answer. All right, so we have a first question. Uh, ben is asking, can we create custom queries over the encrypted data? I think that's for you, Rob. Yeah, so currently the way the samples uh, work at the moment is that only inputs results are encrypted. Um, so we don't encrypt the queries that you send. Um, and because they're talking to a live process, the response is also not encrypted. So any, uh, and when I say queries, I'm specifically talking about the query functionality. Uh, in Temporal, where you can query a workflow and get a result back for queries that it's registered. So the inputs and outputs to those are not encrypted currently. Um, we could look at changing that potentially in the future, but at the moment, it's just the stuff that would actually get stored in the database. The queries are all transient, um, so none of that state is stored. It's not recorded at any point. So the focus was on um, the anything which actually gets committed to the database. I, I, I think... Uh... I would double check that because uh, it still uses the data converter. It does, but it only uses the data converter, which is in, in the latest Go version, it only uses the context driven ones. And those are only added on code paths for inputs and results. In the Java one, I'm not so sure. Um, Java probably would, would, would do. Okay. Thank you, Ben, for asking the question. Next question is from you. On the cloud offering, everyone shares the same temporal cluster or different users can have their own temporal clusters? Yeah, I can take that one. So the answer is that we offer both. Um, so we offer a multi-tenant version of the service, which obviously comes at a much cheaper price tag. Um, but if users are super duper concerned with like performance isolation or security, uh, then we do offer a dedicated uh, version of temporal, which is single tenant. All right. Thank you. Thanks you for asking the question. Uh, Peter, next, how do you recommend to work with a team of tens or hundreds of developers writing activities and workflows? Are there patterns that people have used to uh, help keep code organized and not or, or overwhelming the server? Uh, anybody want to take that one on? So uh, I probably can take that. Sure. Uh, I think the basic idea is that uh, you treat uh, workflows and activities as services. 
and every team, it's just like the same kind of uh, rules you apply to usual service-oriented architectures. Um, the, you define, you, you divide your business logic and services using whatever like uh, approach you use, and uh, every team owns their own workflows and activities, and then other other teams can call them as practically services. And then uh, the question is, how do you share interfaces and so on? It depends on heavily on the language. And you obviously can call things dynamically just by name, for example, activity type uh, from every SDK. And uh, you need to agree on arguments. You absolutely can use protobufs or just uh, structures. In the future, we're actually doing some work to make it very explicit. Uh, in the future, we will have a notion of a service, no notion of a service definition, which can, and uh, it will be higher level than uh, currently available activities and workflows. Uh, that is certainly coming, but it's not the part of the core solution yet. So for now, just uh, treat workflows and activities as uh, your service interfaces. All right, thank you, Maxime, and thank you for Peter for asking that question. Uh, we're waiting for more. We still have about 10 minutes. If anybody else has any more questions, feel free to type them in chat. All right, uh, we have one more from David. Where can I read more about the future service definition feature? Unfortunately, the, there's no, uh, there's not really any public or even fully disseminated uh, private information about it. So you'll have to wait on that one, but uh, we'll make sure to keep updating people as we work on that. But if you have any feedback or ideas around that, uh, talk to us. I think you probably talk to me or Island and uh, we, because we are actively uh, looking into that. So any feedback or any um, ideas? Obviously, as soon as we will have something concrete, we will put a proposal. Uh, I don't know if everyone is aware that we have a proposals repo under temporal org, temporal IO org in uh, GitHub. And uh, every time we kind of come up with some uh, high level uh, and uh, important feature or idea, we usually create, generate a proposal in that repo. For example, there are a bunch of proposals related to Node.js right now. Uh, there, which uh, if you are following Node.js development, you absolutely want to uh, look at the proposals repo. There are quite a few pull requests or landed pull requests recently there. Oh, oh wow, we have some more questions. Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, David, for the question. Um, you again, is there a plan to make the temporal cluster de deployed cross Kubernetes clusters? Now it only works within the same Kubernetes cluster. If can be deployed across Kubernetes cluster. This supports, ah, I scrolled, the distributed scheduling, which is very useful for some of our use cases. I, I think uh, deployment is a little bit orthogonal. You can deploy it temporarily any way you want. Uh, the only hard requirement is that uh, every node should be able to talk to any other node. So if you deploy to two Kubernetes clusters, uh, you can do it. It just means that you need to set up your routing rules in a way that uh, nodes should be able to talk to each other. I think Derek probably, do you have any, anything else there like uh, to add? Mm. Uh, yeah, that's, that's totally possible. Um, you, uh, easy way to do that would be with host networking. If they're both in the same uh, subnet, uh, that'd be sort of the easy button, multi-cluster way to go. Um, and uh, yeah, Maxine's right though. It's, it's just about the accessibility of uh, each worker or each um, service uh, being able to, to reach the other ones. Cool. Derek, and thanks for the question. Michael Tanner is asking, when Scala 3 support coming? <laughs> any ideas of that? I can take that one. Yeah, so we don't have any immediate plans. Um, we know a lot of people have been asking for that. Uh, it's not like in the top three most requested languages, as far as I remember. So um, just to give some sort of like relative um, priority there. Uh, and I think, you know, the one thing is that there is a, a poor man's version available with uh, Java through the JVM, but you won't get like the native Scala experience, unfortunately. But um, anyone, if anyone wants to contribute, talk to us because uh, we certainly can build one pretty easily on top of the Java SDK. Uh, we just want to talk to a little bit lower interfaces in the Java SDK, which are fully asynchronous because you don't want to build Scala on top of uh, and like uh, or Kotlin on top of our synchronous APIs, which are tailored to Java. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested, uh, contact us. Um, Usually the usual path is that we again ask to generate proposal in the proposal repo and after we agree on that, we can decide how to proceed there. Cool. All right, next question we have from Shannon. Uh, what does the web UI roadmap look like so far? Sh Sean, do you want to give a very, very high level uh, idea of what we're thinking about for the uh, temporal web? 
Hey, sorry, I was uh, not ready to speak. <laughs> hey guys, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm um, helping to drive the temporal web roadmap. Uh, essentially, what we're trying to do is um, re write it so temporal web right now is a debugging tool um but we eventually have to evolve it to a hosted platform plus uh, a production monitoring tool uh, plus a debugging tool so that's essentially the goal behind the rewrite uh, that we're working on um we have been <laughs> hiring for this team uh and uh we're, we're going to build it out eventually uh, i don't think we're ready to promise any deadlines uh, just yet, but it is an extremely high priority for us to have a viable cloud offering, um, including things like, you know, auth and uh, teams and um, uh, audit logs and, you know, uh, the, the, the reasonable set of stuff that you might expect. Um, so uh, that's what we're thinking. Um, I mean, I can also talk a little bit about, so right now it's, right now it's uh, mostly view only, um, you know, that it has the ability to terminate workflows, uh, but Definitely in the future, we're thinking about more sort of control, like basically what can we do to make Temporal Web the most important control panel for your workflows? Um, so that's an interesting dimension that we're thinking about. Okay. Thank you, Sean. And thanks for the question. The next question is from Milad. Do you have plans to support setting retention period per workflow? Um, yeah, I can take it. So the answer is we don't have any direct plans. Uh, it's one of the things that we are currently revisiting when we're looking over like the granularity of uh, capabilities that are available to different parts of the, the system. So um, right now there's no direct, I haven't, for example, gotten a lot of uh, feature requests or anything like that for supporting retention period on the workflow level. So this is a good data point there, uh, but we're looking at all of these different decisions again. So there's a chance that it will be revisited for sure. Uh, ben is asking the next question. Can we expose the custom encrypted workflow search attribute? Uh, yeah, so the answer is technically you can. Um, the data converter interface is used for uh, search attributes. The slight gotcha is that the search attributes specifically are handed to the server, introspected by the server in order to hand them over to visibility. So depending on exactly what you meant, it may not be the best idea. Um, if you just wanted to match full text on a custom field, for example, you could encrypt before sending that field and then just search for the encrypted value in the database. Uh, sorry, with, via the visibility query interface. Um, but you wouldn't want to encrypt all of the search attributes, for example, because the server would then not be able to understand them uh, for when it updates the visibility system. Um, so yeah, technically you could, but you'd need to be careful doing that. Um, and I think the kind of general feeling behind it is that search attributes probably wouldn't be encrypted at this point. Um, but obviously, if there's a, you know really strong use cases for doing that, then we can think about something slightly more subtle to enable that kind of pattern to happen more easily. All right. And the follow-up question probably for you as well, Rob, is what stops a rogue user in the multi-tenant environment from overwhelming a shared temporal server? I can actually grab that one. So yeah, uh, right now we have protection on the namespace level for workflow start throttling. And so we can actually make sure that an individual tenant within the uh, temporal service uh, can't take more you know, workflow start resources than we've uh, allocated to them. Um, we're also in the process actually right now of going through um, the, the namespace mechanism and seeing if we can add additional throttling uh, and rate limiting mechanisms. So that way we can further control the amount that a tenant can do within a single namespace. Thank you. Next question is from David. Any guidance on how to design base workflows and activities that are extendable or sub situ? Ah, I can't pronounce this word, by various teams. Go ahead. Anybody? Yeah, Max, I think it depends answer. on the use case because uh, these are uh, workflows and activities are technically RPC, right? Like it's, these are remote calls. So um, you, 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 uh, I've seen the attempts to kind of uh, treat them as local objects. As any RPC framework always uh, suffers for that. <laughs> People treat the, uh, like a remote, a remote RPC calls as local. So um, I think, uh, talk to me uh, directly. We probably can understand your requirements more. Um, I, I think it depends on the use case. And I think there are a lot of ways you can do that. We just, we want to understand the specific use case. I don't think there is one generic answer there. I think um, in the box case study that we have, uh, they talk about how they, they, they accomplish this. This is something that they rely on. So there might be some insights in that as well. 
All right, we got, I think, time for maybe two more. Jens is asking in the Go SDK, going, is the going, uh, Go SDK going to be based on the shared Rust code? And if so, will it require CGO? We, uh, we haven't made any, uh, like, uh, no decision there yet. Ideally, we would, uh, from our point of view, I, uh, but uh, how it's going to work, uh, we'll see. Um, obviously, we have uh, strong incentives to have one core uh, core SDK and uh, build all other SDKs on top of that because it would allow us to move much faster um, and uh, have a single uh, shared library. But uh, if it will uh, break the developer experience, we certainly don't want to do that. Uh, we believe that uh, this uh, goal is probably you can use CGO if you pr uh, provide pre-compiled pre -pre -compiled binaries or pre-compiled libraries. But again, this is not decided yet. And your feedback is certainly very important there. Thank you, Maxime. All right, so last question I think we can get to today is uh, Paul is asking, is Temporal a good solution for workflows with high user interaction? We want to use it in a medical center to control a document life cycle. There are multiple users doing that already, and it's absolutely a uh, valid use case, and uh, it's, uh, Temporal is a very good fit for that. Uh, the caveat is that there are some missing features which we absolutely want to add to the platform. The most notable one is the synchronous update. Right now, uh, you need to do certain workarounds if you need to kind of synchronously wait for workflow to reply to some operation. Right now, you either need to send signal or do query after that. Uh, so, and there are other ways to do that. So it's doable, but uh, it requires additional work. Uh, in the future, we will support synchronous update then you would be able to practically drive page flows and other things uh, through the temporal directly. It would be much easier. Uh, so, yes, it's a good fit, but uh, in the future, it will be even better fit. Um, yeah, maybe just grab Thomas's question. Is there an ETA for .NET? Uh, unfortunately, no, there's not an ETA. I will say that it's like in the top three most requested languages, though. I think it's number two after Python. Great. All right, I think we're uh, already a minute over the time. Well, first of all, if you have any more questions that you we didn't answer today or you can think of later, please go to our community.temporal.io. You can ask them there. Uh, thank you so much for joining these office hours. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for the Temporal team for being here and answering the question and everything. And stay tuned as we, like Rylan said, we're planning to do this more, more of these types of events in the future. Thank you, everybody.